Welcome to r slash pro revenge, where OP makes an easy $30,000. Our next Reddit post is from Saitama Jet. So I'm living in Japan now, and over here people ride bicycles a lot. You can't leave your bike anywhere, and you have to pay for parking between $1 and $2 per day. There are very few free parking areas for bicycles. Most people leave their bikes at the same place, so they pay monthly because it's cheaper and you have your own space. This started a couple of weeks ago. Someone in my building started having a guest who decided to steal my bicycle parking space whenever they came to visit. Sometimes they stayed the whole night, so I had to go to the station, pay $1, and come all the way home walking. Which meant that I would also need to walk to the station the next day, so get up earlier, walk like 20 minutes to the station while carrying my heavy bag. All the bicycle spaces have a number, which means they're reserved for someone. My number is 105, but this douchebag decided to take my spot whenever they came to visit. The second time this happened, I told the building manager, but they didn't do anything. The third time that I saw the bicycle there, I left a note in Japanese saying, please don't leave your bicycle here, this is my space that I use every day. I found the note taped to my parking space, and it had a couple of bad words in Japanese at the end. Basically, he wasn't only stealing my space, but making fun of me by insulting me. Fine, that's just fine. I probably wouldn't have done anything about it if he hadn't written those words, but this triggered me and got the worst in me. This person did it again a couple of times, so I knew this would continue. I was thinking about buying another bicycle, a better, more expensive one that I could use to go on cycling trips, so I needed a good chain slash lock anyways. I bought one of the thickest locks they had at the store and decided to try out its efficiency. I locked up his bicycle the next time that I saw it there. It hasn't moved for the last 7 days. The guy left two notes. The first one was a very aggressive one with more bad words and threats about going to the cops. Which, I don't care, let's go that way buddy. The second note days later was an apology and they begged for me to unlock the bike because they tried to break it but they couldn't. I guess he's learned his lesson. I'm pretty sure he won't do it again but I just want to enjoy this feeling of victory a couple of days more. I'll set the bike free in two to three days I guess. So this post was posted by Saitama Jet, so I'm imagining this person is the unlicensed bicycle rider. Which, if you don't read One Punch Man, won't make any sense, but any One Punch Man fans out there? Our next Reddit post is from Balls to Asia. Several years ago, Barry, my boss, did a job for Big Daddy Construction and got screwed. It wasn't a huge amount of money, just a couple of thousand dollars, but screwed is screwed. Basically, he accepted Big Daddy's word on something that they denied later. Barry consulted his lawyer and was told that since the issue wasn't in writing, that any legal action was likely to fail, and even if he won, the legal cost would exceed any settlement. And Big Daddy basically said, my lawyer can beat up your lawyer. Barry then asked what every lawyer likes to hear. What should I have done differently? Fast forward to 2017. Big Daddy is soliciting bids for a new restaurant called Fancy Pants. Barry submits a bid for supplying and installing door hardware, things like doorknobs, emergency exit bars, door closures that pull the door shut, and three automatic door operators. An automatic door operator is something you've seen before. It has a metal plate with a wheelchair logo mounted on the wall. When you press it, a motor opens the door. It's designed to allow people with limited mobility to pass through a doorway. Barry wins the bid and calls a meeting. He's handling this job personally. All communication with Big Daddy is to go through Barry and only Barry. If someone from Big Daddy calls and says, nice weather, isn't it? We're supposed to reply, I wouldn't know anything about it. Let me transfer you to Barry's line. Under no circumstances is anyone from Big Daddy to be given Barry's cell phone number. All after hours and on-call texts are only to return the call and say that Barry will be in touch the next morning. Violation of any of this will be grounds for immediate dismissal for cause. Is that perfectly clear? A few weeks go by and we get a call from General Contractor, who's not only running the job for Big Daddy, but is Big Daddy's son. He's an untitled douchebag of a tyrant with anger issues and a vocabulary that relies heavily on profanity. For those who don't know, a general contractor is responsible for ensuring that everything gets done on a construction site in the correct order. 
For example, if you're building a bathroom, first you put up the wall studs, then the electrical is run, then the plumbing supplies are roughed in. Next the drywall goes up, then the tile, then the baseboards. Then the walls, ceiling, and trim gets painted. Then the cabinets, light fixtures, and switches are installed. Lastly, the plumbing fixtures go in. So, as you can see, a general contractor has to deal with several different subcontractors and coordinate their efforts. It's a stressful job, and you need the cooperation of various people. And it's hard to get people to work with you if you're screaming swear words at them, something that this general contractor never figured out. We had to install three automatic door openers, two on the entrance and one on the handicap washroom. The conventional washrooms are down a set of stairs on the right, and by law, there has to be a washroom available for people using wheelchairs. This bathroom is on a bit of a corridor of sorts used by the servers to bring food in and dishes out. The partitions separating the corridor are about shoulder high, separating the corridor from the seating area. The decor of this restaurant was fancy, and it was meant to resemble a Victorian gentleman's club, with oak throughout and thick carpets on the floor. The feature wall at the front is also worthy of mention, with alcoves for displaying sculptures and places to hang paintings. So the general contractor calls us because they're ready for the automatic door openers to be installed. We arrive and install everything. By the terms of the bid, it's Big Daddy's responsibility to supply dedicated 120 volt electricity for the automatic door openers, and to run the 12 volt wires from the activation plates to the top of the doorway so they can be connected to the circuit board for the ADOs. None of this was present at the time of the install, so Barry ran an extension cord to power the automatic door openers, and he used a wireless transmitter and receiver to trigger it. All of this was specified in the bid, which said that we could install and then return to hook up the wires once they get run. Barry came and personally supervised the technician who was installing the automatic door openers. When the general contractor signed off on the work, buried deep in the description was a line or two referencing the relevant sections of the bid. When the general contractor signed off on the handicap washroom install, there was a line noting that Big Daddy assumes all responsibility for compliance with the relevant building code section. The general contractor didn't bother to read what he was signing, he just scribbled a signature and took his copy. Barry made certain that the technician was right beside him when the general contractor signed off. Malicious compliance number one. It's about two weeks before opening and Big Daddy is in the finishing stages. Barry gets a frantic call from the general contractor that none of the automatic door openers are working and they need these to be functional or they won't get their occupancy permits. Barry heads down the next day with a tech. Barry says, well, I found the problem. The general contractor says, So then fix the effing problem! There's no 120 volt run to the doors, and there's no 12 volt wires to hook up the buttons. You didn't run the power? Why didn't you run the power? It's not in the scope of work in the bid. You're supposed to do it. Why didn't you tell me that when you were here the first time? I did, and you signed off on it. Where's the effing electrician? Electrician, get your butt over here! Huh? What's up? Why isn't there any power for these door operators? It's not part of my scope of work. Barry says, there's some good news. What? If we use wireless for the buttons, then we won't need 12 volt wires. I'll have to bill you for it as an add-on, but once you get me 120 volts, those automatic door openers will be working. At this point, General Contractor realizes how screwed he is. The restaurant interior is like 90% complete, and there's no power to a critical part of the building. Without that power, no permit. Big Daddy has screwed up big time because he assumed that either Barry or the electrician would run the wires, even though it wasn't put into the scope of either of our bids. The electrical panel is in the back of the kitchen, and there's no way to bring 120 volts to the front entrance except across the ceiling, which would be nearly impossible. All the lighting and the ornate false ceiling was already in. Even if the electrician was able to magically do that, he would either have to run a metal conduit down the surface of the feature wall or rip out a good chunk of it, run the wires, and reinstall it. The handicap washroom automatic door opener wasn't much of a problem since it was closer and the wires could be run through the false ceiling. The electrician charged the general contractor big dollars for the extra work. Malicious compliance number two. Remember that handicap washroom? 
Well, when the building inspector came to do a pre-check, they discovered that the square footage of the washroom, minus the area taken up by the inward swinging door, was less than the required minimum. This needed a quick fix, because dismantling the washroom, moving a wall, and relocating the plumbing fixtures would be too expensive and would take too long. So, the general contractor decided to reverse the swing of that door and have it swing into the corridor rather than into the washroom. This had a really bad effect on the operation of Fancy Pants once it opened. Because anytime someone wanted to use the washroom, the door blocked the flow of servers in and out of the kitchen. And people are lazy, so even able-bodied people were prone to using this washroom because it was closest. I don't know what the conversations between Fancy Pants and Big Daddy were like, but I imagine they were pretty intense. But who cares? After all, the general contractor signed off on that, too. Also, Barry got to send an invoice for an entirely separate automatic door opener. Because the original was a pull style, and reversing the swing meant a push style was required. And now, the pro revenge. The general contractor called Barry a few days after discovering the entrance doors needed 120 volts to tell Barry that 120 volts were available. Barry headed down to the restaurant with a tech to check it out. In the vestibule was a heater known as an air curtain. It's a big heater designed to push a high volume of warmed air into the vestibule to mitigate cold outside air entering the restaurant. It pulls a significant amount of electricity every time it kicks on. And the general contractor had tied the 120 volts for the entrance door's automatic door openers into the same circuit. Barry explains that their bid specified that the automatic door openers required their own dedicated circuits, one for each. The general contractor responds that he doesn't care, just hook the damn things up! So, Barry does just that, and he has the general contractor sign off again. Only this time, buried in the sign-off sheet is an acknowledgement that by not providing dedicated circuits, all warranties are void, and subsequent service would be billable. Just like usual, the general contractor scribbles his signature and takes his copy without reading it. These automatic door openers are finicky about power. There's a motor controlled by a circuit board that determines how fast the door opens, how long it stays open, how fast it closes, how much force is used, that sort of thing. If it takes a spike in power, it fails, and the automatic door opener no longer functions. A power spike blows a fuse and damages one of the components of the control board. This is replaceable, and that part is worth like 30 bucks. The control board can be fixed in about half an hour, with another half hour on top of that to make sure everything is running correctly. Barry had sent one of his techs to the manufacturer to get certified in rebuilding the board, even though our standard was to just ship them back to the manufacturer and get a replacement. Sure enough, a couple of days later, the general contractor calls in a panic. They have the final occupancy inspection scheduled for the next day, and one of the automatic door openers at the entrance is down. Your effing automatic door opener isn't working. Get down here and fix it. Okay, but it's not covered under warranty, so it's billable. What the F are you talking about? It hasn't even been a week and it's broken, so it is under warranty. No, warranties were all voided when you didn't provide clean power. F that. Get down here and put in a new automatic door opener. It doesn't need a new automatic door opener, it needs a new control board, and I can get a new control board from the manufacturer in about four to six weeks. The general contractor loses his mind. There's no way that he can delay the opening of Fancy Pants for six weeks waiting for a single part. He calls Barry every name in the book, threatens legal action, etc. Barry responds, Look, General Contractor, I have a control board on the shelf that was rebuilt by a factory certified technician. I can let you have it at, nah, 80% of the list price of a new one, and I can have it installed by noon tomorrow. Do you want it rebuilt, or do you want a new part, and do you agree that this is billable as per the terms of the bid? Yes! Just get the effing thing fixed by tomorrow! Now, Barry knows that General Contractor and Big Daddy were going to try to screw him just like they did years ago. That time, it was a, I never said that, dispute. What General Contractor didn't know was that every time he called Barry, the call was recorded. You know that whole, this call may be recorded for quality assurance purposes that you get when you dial in? Well, Barry never used his cell phone, never initiated a call. And so every time the general contractor called in, it was recorded and archived. 
every single time. Sure enough, another couple of days go by and another automatic door opener goes down again. Barry asks the general contractor if he's good with the rebuild, gets confirmation, removes the blown part, installs the rebuild, then takes the blown control board back to the shop and rebuilds it. A new control board is 750 bucks. For the rebuild, Barry's charging $600 for a part that maybe cost $75 to get back into shape. The bid specified that non-warranty service was $125 per hour for a minimum of 4 hours. So tack on another 500 bucks for labor and it takes maybe 45 minutes to install a new control board and dial it in. So every control board replacement was generating $1,100. There were 27 blown control board swaps in the first two months. General Contractor called in every single one of them, and Barry got his verbal approval for each one. If someone from Fancy Pants Restaurant called in, we gave them General Contractor's number and said that we could only come and fix it if the General Contractor was the one to call it in. Then, Barry gets a call from Daddy of Big Daddy, wanting to know what this invoice for almost $30,000 is for. Barry explains and a meeting is called. Barry brings his lawyer and all copies of the sign-off sheets, as well as transcripts of every conversation he had with General Contractor. It becomes very apparent that General Contractor effed up huge and that Barry had dotted every I and crossed every T. Big Daddy is glaring daggers at General Contractor and basically tells Barry that if he wants to get paid, he's going to have to sue for his money. Barry smiles and slides his ace across the table. It's a contractor's lien against Big Daddy, Fancy Pants Restaurant, and Massive Realty Company, the owners of the building. Here's the thing. Fancy Pants was owned by internationally famous chef who makes his living getting very important people to invest in opening a new restaurant. This is a place where they go to be very important and bring their business contacts with them. After a short time, when the restaurant is the happening place in town, the investors sell the place and cash out huge. Internationally famous chef sticks around, helps with the transition, and makes a percentage of the restaurant's profits for the use of his name. He built an income stream with the investor's money, and the investors make a nice return. Only now, with a lien on the place, they can't sell it. And these investors have rabid pit bulls as lawyers. Hell, some of them are lawyers. See you in court, Big Daddy. Only, you're not facing Barry's lawyer, you're facing a whole new level of legal expertise. Have fun with that. Barry got his revenge, and then withdrew service based on the disputed invoice. He's the only company allowed to service and install this brand of automatic door opener because he's a protected territory from the manufacturer, and he does seven figures worth of business with them a year. The only other companies anywhere nearby were warned off by the manufacturer, who even relayed the fact that Big Daddy had called them directly looking for service, and they referred Big Daddy to Barry. Barry will definitely get paid, as it's standard to hold back 10% of the payment to a construction company for a year, and the holdback will definitely cover the invoice. So Fancy Pants will pay Barry and then take it out of Big Daddy's holdback. Either way, they'll sue Big Daddy into dust or force Big Daddy to cough up and settle the lien. Who knows what company Big Daddy picked up to cover the doors. Barry has friends in the industry and warned them all about Big Daddy, but there are always douchebag competitors. And Barry didn't say a thing to them. Maybe Big Daddy is screwing over one of the competition, and what hurts his competition helps Barry. What makes this deliciously pro-revenge? You think that maybe, just maybe, Barry, who has decades of experience in the industry, might have had an electrician friend that could show him the electrical bid? And that maybe, just maybe, Barry knew from the beginning that there was no provision for 120 volts in either package? Or that the washroom was too small? Or that General Contractor, a corner cutter, would take the easy way out and hook the automatic door openers into the air curtain? Way to go, Barry. Nicely played. That was r slash pro revenge, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.